So it's now my pleasure to properly introduce tonight's speaker. As the chief foreign affairs commentator for the Financial Times, Gideon Rachman translates his tr extensive travels and his remarkable access to world leaders into an insider's view of global events. Through his weekly contributions at the Financial Times, Gideon shares insights about economics, politics, and globalization as they apply to Asia, Europe, the Middle East, the Americas, and more. Before joining the Financial Times, Gideon worked for The Economist for 15 years and served as a foreign correspondent in Brussels, Bangkok, Washington, and as business editor. So for those of you here tonight, please do see the program flyer for his full bio because there's more. <laughs> please join me in welcoming Gideon Rachman for a conversation about America's rise. Excuse me. So your book is your book is titled Easternization, and with the sea change in the U.S. administration from President Obama to President Trump, there is a great deal of uncertainty about U.S. foreign policy objectives and principles. But current events, I would argue, continue to place the Middle East and global terrorism at the top of the foreign policy agenda. Your work, however, is focused on a longer-term trend and one which has far-reaching consequences for the 21st century, namely the steady rise of China and the potential of geopolitical conflict with the US, or what you refer to as Easternization. So maybe we can start by just having you explain a bit about what you mean by Easternization. Sure. Well, thanks for inviting me. And um, it's really good to be in San Francisco. Um, and what do I mean by Easternization? Well, you mentioned the, the uh, incipient rivalry between the U.S. and China, and the, and the relationship between the U.S. and China is at the core of the book, but I try to place it in a much sort of broader historical and geographical context, by which I mean that um, I, I think that what's going on is, is a broader transfer of economic and political power from the West, broadly defined, to the East, to, to, to Asia, and that within that, the rise of China is the kind of key event. But you can't really understand the rise of China without seeing it as part of uh, a broader transformation, economic transformation in Asia, uh, which really gets rolling in the 1950s with the rise of Japan. And then in the 60s and 70s, you have countries like South Korea, the tigers, uh, economies of Southeast Asia getting going. Um, and so when China starts growing very dramatically in the 80s and 90s. It's, in a sense, following a pattern that had already been uh, laid out before by other successful, rapidly industrializing Asian economies. But when China joins this process, and then in India does in 91, uh, it's transformational because they're such big countries. So it's one thing for a, a South Korea or Singapore to, to grow at rates of 9%, 10% a year. But if you have that happening in countries of over a billion people, then it, it really transforms the global economy and by now I think is beginning to transform global politics as well because by the Obama years really, it becomes clear that the rise of China and, and to an extent India has transformed the balance of the global economy. So in 2014, um, the IMF comes up with this new ranking of world economy uh, economies by purchasing power and they say, well, China's now the largest economy in the world by PPP. And three of the four largest economies in the world are in Asia, China, then, then the US and then Japan and India. Um, and some s say, well, that's a kind of statistical quirk. It's a kind of odd way of measuring the economies. But there are other ways of indicating the same trend. So by then, China is already the world's largest manufacturer, the world's largest exporter, um, and also, interestingly, a very large market as well. It's not just a producer churning stuff out to be shipped over to ports, you know, in the Pacific coast of America, but it's by now the largest market, say, for, for Daimler-Benz. It's the biggest market for the Apple iPhone. It's the biggest market for KFC. So th these, um, uh, yeah, they're eating a lot of fried chicken over there. Um, <laughs> so um, so that has, has really reshaped the global economy. Uh, just to give you something I just saw yesterday, the FT was running up 
a list of the world's 10 biggest container ports, and they're all in Asia. Six of the 10 are in China. Um, and then the book takes that on and then looks at what that means geopolitically. Um, and I'll stop in a second, but I, but I think it's important to, to see it not just as a sort of here and now a confrontation between a rising China and the established superpower America. It is that, but it's also part of a very big historical trend because I think for the last 500 years, really, the world's been shaped above all by the West. It begins with the, the rise of the Western or the European empires at the, at the end of the 1400s. By 1914, 80% of the world is either uh, Europe or European colonies or countries that have been settled by Europeans like the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. And even when Europe rips, rips itself apart in the First and Second World Wars, uh, the US then becomes the dominant power. And it's really only now that you're beginning to see non-Western powers emerging as shaping the world in the way that the West has. And I think that will be the trend of the 21st century. So one of the one of the interesting comments that uh, you make at the beginning of your book is that by 2025, it's estimated that two thirds of the world's population will be in Asia. So, in your view, is this Easternization an inevitable change, and is China the only natural dominant global power in Asia for the 21st century? Well, I, I think that that the population stats really matter because. Um, Lying behind the, these economic statistics just is the weight of population. It didn't used to matter so much because for slightly different reasons, both China and India um, had cut themselves off from the world economy. China through Maoism, India uh, hadn't really got its act together economically, uh, followed a different path uh, from the Asian tigers up until the 90s. And so that weight of population didn't uh, make itself felt. But once these economies really start growing, then the fact that I think that Hans Rosling, the late uh, Swedish demographer, said the world's PIN code is 4111, by which he meant there are 4 billion people living in Asia, and there's a billion in Europe, a billion in the Americas, and a, a billion in Africa, and that that will change to by 2050 to 5 for Asia, 2 for Africa, 1, 1. But uh, once these Asian countries are developed or, or, or semi-developed by Western standards, then their, their economic clout is enormous in the global economy. Uh, you say, will it, is it inevitable that China will dominate? Uh, well, clearly China is now the, the only plausible challenger to the United States as, as a global power. At the moment, that challenge is focused in Asia, but that's really important because Asia is the core of the global economy. I think you can see maybe by 2050, maybe even earlier, that India will emerge as a second uh, Asian superpower. And in fact, we had quite an interesting story in the FT today saying that the Indian population may just have surpassed that of China. Um, so that would be quite a dramatic moment, if true. So one of the, one of the caveats to, to this argument is that China's economic growth has slowed. Mm -hmm. They have an aging population and the environmental challenges are quite large. So is this trend of China's growing influence in the global economy sustainable, or are there factors that could stunt their rise? Well, look, it, it's inevitable that they're not going to keep growing at the incredible rates that they did for some 30 years, and that's already happened. The Ch Chinese growth is now below 7%. I remember until quite recently they used to say, well, it was a complete social and political imperative that they had to grow at 8% or there'd be some sort of terrible social explosion. And they're now going to, you know, the economy will slow further. But one's got to remember that it, it's in now a, a huge economy. So for an economy that size to be growing at even 5 4% is, is quite something. I think the demographic challenge that you mentioned is the one big question mark in my mind about the rise of China and, and, and whether it could really come to a grinding Halt. I mean, anybody who's seen what's happened to Japan since the 1990s has to have some respect for the power of demography and what happens when countries age. Um, that said, I think that there are still forces in China which will keep uh, a, a strong measure of dynamism. I mean, one is continuing urbanization. The country is... Um, is not, I think it only recently passed the 50% urban mark. And certainly if you look at the Chinese uh, 
sense of where their growth is com going to come from. They do believe that the movement of people from the countryside to the cities is going to continue to be a, a driving force for them. I think the other thing is that there's still a, a, a strong element of catch up with uh, the l standards of living of the West, so that uh, China's an enormous economy because it's such a large country, but the average Chinese does not have the, the living standards of the average American or even the average Japanese. So they, there is still potential for catch up. And I think this comparison with Japan is an interesting one, but the moment where Japan sort of began to really slow down, it had already basically achieved the comparable living standards to the advanced economies of the West. China's still got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so President Obama clearly recognized that China as an economic challenger to the United States uh, was an important issue for the administration to address. And so the, the pivot to Asia was a strategic policy mm -hmm. initiative on the part of the administration. Um, they weren't necessarily able to achieve, achieve what they had hoped because of their preoccupation with other issues around the world. Um, but I do want to turn to our current president and, and talk a little bit about, about him as a wild card here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and just bring up a couple of a couple of things that of note. Um, certainly, during the presidential election, can, um, candidate Trump, in publishing his contract with the American voter, promised to direct the Secretary of the Treasury to label China a currency manipulator. And then later, in meeting with Xi Jinping, he said, "We have a good chemistry together." So. The question of what the Trump administration's posture is toward China, and particularly on the economic front, how do you anticipate U.S.-China relations and U.S. resistance to China might change under the Trump administration? Well, you're right. It's, uh, to put it politely, it's rapidly evolving. I mean, it's it's changing quite fast. Um, but I think that Trump was was a, a interesting in regards to China because he was the first presidential major presidential candidate, now president, who said very explicitly, actually, the rise of China economically is really bad for us. Uh, you know, m previous presidents would have said, well, it's, you know, it's a, uh, it's basically a positive thing. Uh, you know, we approve of it. There are some things we want to fix and, you know, more market opening and so on. And here's China, here's Trump saying China's raping our country. It's responsible for the devastation of the American middle class. And Steve Bannon uh, gave an interview shortly after Trump had won, where he said what globalization has done essentially is to create a middle class in Asia and destroy the middle class in the West. Um, and so all the early rhetoric suggests that Trump is in a, that this is one of the few things that Trump has thought for a long time. He was a protectionist against Japan in the late 80s. He supposed every trade agreement America's ever reached and that, that this would be at least one thing that you could identify he was going to do. And then he brings in Peter Navarro, author of a book called Death by China, as his new, the head of his new trade council. So it does look like we're heading for protectionism. Uh, but he then, uh, for you know, a variety of reasons, sit backs off. Uh, and it, oddly enough, the Japanese are the main victims of his protectionism, because the first thing he does is scrap the TPP when he comes in. And that looks like a prelude, which is a big blow to Japan, which is a member of it and China isn't. Um, and then that looks like a prelude for maybe further action against China, but Xi Jinping gets in there quite quickly. Uh, and then at the Mar-a-Lago Mar Summit A, as you point out, clearly works his charm on Trump. Uh, but they then announce a very Obama-like kind of agreement that far from imposing swinging tariffs, and Trump had spoken of tariffs of up to 45% on Chinese goods, that they're going to have a joint commission to look at problems. And then a month later, they come up with some announcements about, well, allowing uh, American credit rating agencies to have a bit more access to China and sell a bit more beef for, for farmers. It's all, you know, it's, it's, it is not this dramatic change. Now... Trump is so volatile that it's it's certainly possible that he will go back to the former position. I really wouldn't say, oh, well, the Chinese are home free and that's it for protectionism. Uh, it's it's possible that it, this instinct, which has been in for, 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 a, for a long time, will, will come back. Uh, but it is interesting. Why has, why has he softened it? Um, partly, maybe it's been explained to him that, it, you know, the difficulties, but also because... The emergence of the North Korean issue, oddly, has been 
very beneficial for China because Trump has uh, decided that he needs China to help uh, end the North Korean nuclear threat and has said explicitly, you know, I can't be imposing sanctions on China when I need their cooperation on North Korea. So we'll have to see how that goes. I mean, if he then decides that actually the Chinese are to blame for the continuation of the North Korean nuclear program, maybe he'll swing back towards protectionism. But he does seem to have been charmed by Xi and uh, he said, you know, what a terrific guy he is and how he's a real patriot. I don't know whether he why that should be a surprise, but uh, um, <laughs> and so uh, so we'll see. Well, we're, well, we definitely want to turn to these larger geopolitical um, mm. challenges. But before we do, I want to I want to stick with the economic relationship for a moment. And but but one of the questions is: Does China recognize the statements being made by by President Trump as as continued campaign type rhetoric now that he's in the White House, or well, it's Do interesting. They see um, more? Um, I, I was in uh, in Beijing about, uh, I guess, a month before the vote, and in fact, when the first debates were going on, and uh, the Chinese, I I thought the ch official Chinese I were meeting and the sort of semi-official academics uh, were clearly pulling for Trump, um, which was um, because they really didn't like Hillary Clinton because they associated her with the pivot to Asia, which they saw as a basically a fancy way of saying that America was trying to contain China. Um, and then I was trying to say to them, and, then, and when, when you'd say, well, what about all this protectionist stuff that Trump is spouting? They'd say, oh, you know, all American candidates say that kind of thing. You know, Clinton was said he was going to get tough on China, and then they get in office, and it's, they, they calm down. And basically, Republicans have tended to be better for us than Democrats because they're not so. They don't bang on about human rights so much. They they tend to be uh, tend to be very business focused. So we, we we sort of want Trump. And I was saying to them, no, no, you totally misunderstand. This guy is not a standard issue Republican. He's re he's for, it's very different. But actually, in retrospect, I think maybe they were more right than I was, and that he has followed the trajectory that they anticipated. Um, and they also. I think played Trump very well because I think that they, they definitely had a big wobble in their attitude to is this guy good or bad for us when Trump took the phone call from President Tsai Ing-wen in, in, in Taiwan and it looked like he was reversing the one China policy which all US presidents had, had followed since the late 1970s and um, that was an extremely confrontational move. But the Chinese played it quite well because they simply said, well, look, until America reasserts the one China policy, there will be no contact between the Chinese and American presidents. And uh, as far as we can tell, the White House sort of thought about this for a while, a few weeks passed, and then they said, oh, okay. And, uh, and uh, a phone call was scheduled, and uh, Trump reaffirmed the one China policy. And, and essentially China had won that particular round. And it was important because it was the first overt confrontation uh, in which America yielded, um, partly because one assumes that uh, you know Trump had not thought through, or the people around him hadn't thought through the consequences or didn't realize how China would react. But when they did, they, they backed off. Well, it, it, it does seem as if the administration has conceded a bit to China. Um, certainly, President Obama spent most of the, his years in, in office working to build the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a counterweight mm. to China's dominance, and Trump's decision to kill that deal mm. uh, would leave the door open for China. The other thing that's interesting is a, a, a sharp shift in U.S. policy. Trump has offered support for the China's One Belt, One Road initiative. Mm -hmm an infrastructure project spanning 60-plus countries in Asia, the Middle East, Europe, Africa. Is this decision to recognize the One Belt, One Road Forum in the interest of the United States? Does it help to actually increase China's influence in the region, and is that a good well, thing Well, I mean, I, I think it's... I, I don't think it's necessarily a mistake, um, because it's... There was a preview of this when... when China set up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, which is part of this effort to build up institutions that will help 
uh, fund infrastructure right across Asia, but that will have a very China-centric focus. It's in Beijing, the Chinese are the major shareholders, uh, and it was seen, uh, it still is, as a kind of potential rival to the World Bank. And the Obama administration opposed it, tried to block it, tried to block uh, other Western powers from taking part in it. And it was a debacle because uh, the the others broke ranks. I'm afraid, uh, not I'm afraid, but the British led the way. Uh, and when we joined and signed up, it was quite an interesting moment because the for the UK, the special relationship with the US is, is central to our security, to our approach to the world. But I think the British government under David Cameron, trying to think ahead, thought, look, we, we have to have a, a good economic relationship with China. Potentially, this off offers all sorts of interesting economic opportunities. So on this, we're going to break ranks with the Americans. And when the British did it, the other European powers followed, the Australians followed, and the Americans were left looking fairly foolish. So there was a danger that um, if they did the same with one belt, one road, the same thing would happen again. And so I think it was, you know, I, it's it's both sensible and pragmatic to, to go, but also to have at the back of your mind that, yeah, this might not necessarily be entirely in America's interest, but you can't probably stop it. So you should uh, better to be generous spirited about it to, to go to say, yeah, we might we might be interested in taking part in this to uh, rather than making a kind of feeble and failed effort to stop it. Oh yeah. One belt, one road. Okay, so it's 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 again. the current sort of Chinese obsession, which is uh, a big um, initiative by the Chinese government, uh, given this jargon title, one belt, one road, to spread infrastructure uh, development, uh, and the the road, confusingly, is actually the sea bit uh, to to so that's to develop connections between China on the maritime routes through the South China Sea and through the Indian Ocean and then all the way to Africa by, say, building up ports. There's a lot of Chinese investment in, in ports. But then the, uh, the belt is developing infrastructure across Eurasia, so from China through Russia, through Central Asia, all the way to Europe, uh, th whether that's roads, rail, um, and so on, and the amount of investment they're talking about is billion, uh, over 100 billion a year, um, and it's it's conceived of as a sort of partnerships with lots of countries along the route, Central Asian countries, Pakistan, uh, and the idea is that you will create a whole new highways for commerce. Um, that's the why a lot of people are interested when they had this One Belt One Road conference in Beijing. Was it last week or the week before? Over 100 countries sent representatives uh, because they can see that potentially this is, uh, you know, good for them if, if, if there's, there's new infrastructure built up. The benefits for China are potentially both economic and geopolitical. Economically, it provides a way of exporting capital, of providing uh, new markets for Chinese companies. Um, uh, particularly construction companies. There's who has been a lot of construction in China, and they they need places, to, new places to go and build. Uh, but it, but it also has geopolitical implications, so that the Indians, for example, who are quite suspicious of this and who didn't send a government delegation to to the conference in Beijing, say a lot of these projects don't actually make much economic sense, but they may make geopolitical sense because they start binding. C countries like, say, Pakistan and Sri Lanka in <laughs> South Asia, both neighbors of I India, into a sort of Chinese sphere, that if you're creating railways and roads, uh, that sort of all roads lead to Beijing rather than Rome in this case, exactly. um, and that that has a, uh, a big payoff for, for China. Yes, and in my own experience, um, having spent some time in Central Asia, and being in Uzbekistan on one of the roads that mm. the Chinese had built, the skepticism and the concern about the level of influence China would then have, and also just the, the, the change in direction, the idea that the, the goods and resources coming out of Central Asia, instead of going north to what was the Soviet Union or Russia, mm. would now go east Yeah, And we, talk, we talked about American ambivalence, but the Russians even more must be highly ambivalent about this because 
Putin's big project is a Eurasian economic union, which was a, an attempt in a way to recreate the Soviet space. And here you have the much more dynamic Chinese economy moving in the other direction into Central Asia, the former Soviet republics of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, yeah. and pulling them into a Chinese sphere of influence, which is really not what the Russians want. And, and yet Putin attended the, the conference uh, and you know sat in the front row, was a guest of honor. So he too has made the, the calculation that I think the Americans made that we can't really stop this, so perhaps we should try to get in there and mold it. Yeah. So China is clearly a, a, a challenger an economic challenger on the global st stage, but let's turn a little bit to the question of, of military and political conflict. Mm. Um, and I, I want to note that you have previously praised Graham Allison and talked about his thesis about Thucydides' trap, mm. uh, the predisposition towards conflict as an ascendant China asserts its role in the world mm. and on the global stage. And President Xi and the Chinese have also s spoken about Thucydides' trap. So. Graham Allison will actually be here in a couple of weeks to talk about this more, but I would want, wondered if you could give us a little preview about what that thesis sure. is and how likely you see it as a source of conflict. Yeah, well, I mean, the reason I write about it in the book is uh, not so much because of, of Graham Allison per se, but because it was very striking to find uh, at a meeting I was in Beijing with with. Xi Jinping, where there was a group of Western, visiting Westerners, and he gave a little speech to us, and he referred explicitly to this notion of Thucydides' trap, which was an idea promulgated by Graham Alice Allison, a Harvard professor, which uh, goes back to ancient Greece, and the idea being that a rising power uh, tends eventually to go to war with the established power and Thucydides, because Thucydides had written about how this had happened in the relationship between Sparta and Athens. And then Allison had looked at the pattern throughout history and said, actually, this, this has happened. He studies 16 cases. In 12 of the 16 cases, this had led to war between the established and the rising power. Interesting bit of political science, but what was particularly interesting to me was that the Chinese president had taken note of this and was giving a speech saying, we must all strive together to avoid Thucydides' trap. And essentially, you know, when you translated it, was saying to a Western audience, I recognize the risk that China will go to war with the United States, and I'm going to try and prevent it, or we must all collectively try to prevent it. Um, and yet, if you look at what both China and America are doing, although both rhetorically would say, of course, we have a, a joint interest in avoiding that, they are both... Uh, well, China in particular has been pouring money into its military, uh, double-digit increases in its um, military spending, with a pretty clear aim of challenging American hegemony in the Pacific, which has prevailed since 1945, really. And that's become much more explicit in the last couple of years with this island-building program that the mm -hmm. Chinese have been uh, undertaking in the South China Sea, where the Chinese have a claim to, uh, appears to claim 90% of the sea. They have this f famous nine-dashed line, uh, which actually it's not entirely explicit whether that's claiming that all those waters are Chinese. I asked a Chinese official, you know, are you saying all the water within here is yours? And they said, we, we prefer to remain ambiguous about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, in fact, suggested we drink a toast to ambiguity. Uh, so, um, but what they do claim is that, that all, the, uh, all the islands within that area are, are theirs. And that amounts to much the same thing, because once you start drawing exclusion zones around the islands, uh, the water's uh, pretty much Chinese. And... What they've then been doing in the last couple of years is taking a lot of these places that were sandbanks or reefs uninhabited and dr through huge dredging exercises, building them up into, into regular l islands. And then not just that, putting airstrips on them, putting, uh, now seems, uh, missiles. Um, and so militarizing, the, turning, turning these things into military bases. And uh, the United States, although it's... Uh, formal position is that it doesn't uh, take a position on the territorial disputes in the South China Sea, does say it's concerned about freedom of navigation, uh, 
sees this as a potential move by China to put itself in a position to control those waters. So it's been under Obama sending the US Navy past these reefs as a way of kind of signaling unhappiness. But it seems a little late in the day. These things have already been been uh, been established. And interestingly, Trump, again, we talked about his inconsistency. So early in the uh, Trump administration, Rex Tillerson gave testimony before the the Senate, where he appeared to say that the U.S. was preparing to block China's access to those islands, which caused a kind of shock all over the world, because that would be a recipe for war. And indeed, the Chinese newspapers said, you know, we're heading for World War Three. Um, and then within a month, the Americans backed off that and actually don't appear even to have been doing the naval exercises that they were doing under Obama to signal unhappiness with these things and then but to get back to the question so does this mean that the, these tensions that, that that they will lead to war um i don't think so necessarily uh i mean it's interesting if you look at allison's case studies i think only two of the 16 uh cases were post the nuclear age uh post and and neither of those actually did lead to war um but, so it's possible that as in the cold war nuclear weapons the balance of terror will prevent uh, the countries taking the kind of risks they would have taken in the pre-nuclear age. But there is a risk, particularly um, with so much of this taking place way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, that you could have a clash between the US and Chinese navies, or maybe the Chinese and Japanese navies, and America has a security alliance with Japan, uh, and that that then escalates because both, it's not just Trump who's, uh, who's a nationalist and who said, make America great again. Xi Jinping's uh, great slogan is the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people, which is a sort of Chinese version of make China great again. And I think that with, with nationalist rhetoric in both Washington and Beijing, it might be hard for either side to back down if there were ever a, even an accidental military confrontation. So it's, it's quite a dangerous situation, but you know, if it's, if it's any comfort, I wouldn't put my money on there actually being a war. I don't think there will be. Well, you've answered at least two questions that no, I right. have before I could even ask them. Okay. So I'll, I'll ask them again <laughs> if you like. <laughs> no, that's I'll okay. give you a different answer. <laughs> and and uh, you, you are getting at the, the sources of the greatest tension um, and this, this interesting strategy of basically creating sovereign territory out of sand yeah. <laughs> in the middle of the South China Sea is pretty clever, you have to say. Um, but what what is also interesting is the, the traditional challenge of Taiwan. And so let's come back to Taiwan mm -hmm. for a moment. And I think that many people asked after Trump had that phone call whether he understood what he was doing, whether or not it was, whether or not he understood the, the, ch the challenge that it would be mm -hmm. to the Chinese for him to speak to the the president of Taiwan on the phone, and and then ultimately he backed down from it. But my question to you is, how likely are those kinds of actions by the Trump administration, speaking to, speaking to Taiwan and provoking the Chinese, um, Tillerson saying, we won't allow you access to these islands, mm -hmm. first and foremost. How likely are those kinds of rhetorical challenges um, to provoke a confrontation that they might not have intended? Well, I think, I think you've got to look at the way that the Chinese dealt with them. And I think in both cases, they, they re reacted quite calmly by, and decided because they had the same question in their heads, you know, is this a deliberate challenge to us or does he just not understand? And so they, they tested it. Uh, and they said, okay, we're not going to talk to you until, and then Trump backed off. And similarly on the South China Sea, the rhetoric in the Chinese newspapers, and of course that would have been authorized uh, given the nature of China, was very, very heated and said there'll be a war and so on. But nobody official in the Chinese government said that. So they could send the message about the, how dangerous it was without tying themselves as a government to a very bellicose statement. And, uh, and again, I think they just played for time and had, in, you know, had what Tillerson said actually been for real and the US Navy really attempted to intercept say Chinese planes heading for Mischief Reef or what any of these other places that they've built up attempted to intervene I think the Chinese would have tried to break the blockade and you would have ended up in a shooting war but they they waited to see whether 
how America would behave. And then America's behavior on those two issues suggested that the interpretation that they actually hadn't known what they were saying or was Tillerson misspoke or Trump hadn't realized the implications uh, was the correct interpretation. So I think that the Chinese will have concluded that actually um, this bellicose rhetoric that the, that the Americans have been a paper tiger on this stuff and that they will back off and they'll be feeling much more confident now. And what, is, and what does that say about, about U, U.S. leadership in the world that, that we <coughs> are so easily <laughs> manipulated? Well, in not, nothing good, I, I think, because, I mean, it's interesting that uh, Obama was often accused of weakness by the Republicans and then by Trump. Uh, and indeed, South the South China Sea was part of the charge sheet, you know, Ukraine, Syria, etc. But I think that it's clear that he was pretty conflict averse. He was he was after the Iraq War quite keen to avoid any other wars, um, and you can argue whether he was too cautious or not. But I think that he at least was very deliberative. Uh, one of the reasons that he didn't, you know, that the, the Americans when they eventually decided to have this this naval, this naval f- freedom of navigation operation past a couple of these reefs, that was after six months of debate within the White House about, well, how exactly to respond, what would the Chinese response be? And indeed, Obama was attacked for thinking too hard, but, you know, waiting too long and so on. But nobody could accuse him of not having understood the issue. Um, uh, whereas I think here... You, you definitely could say that. And um, and similarly, Obama's response to the Taiwan phone call was quite interesting. He said, look, you know, this is a complicated issue and it's perfectly fine for any administration to come in and say they want to take another look at it, but they have to have thought through the consequences. Um, and it was evident that they hadn't. And I think that um, the danger is that it, it undermines, you know, there's a t- it's a terrible word, credibility, so I try to avoid, <laughs> it leads to all sorts of traps, but, but it does undermine at least a sense that America is a reliable power. Um, and I think that tr- there's sort of three levels of unreliability that Trump introduces into the way that people think about America's role in the world. The first is to do with the policies that he's advocated, so that suddenly you have a U.S. president who at least rhetorically is questioning some of the bedrock commitments of the United States. You know, NATO is obsolete, or maybe it isn't. NAFTA, I'm going to rewrite it, or or maybe I'm not. But so these are things where America's allies and adversaries thought, okay, we we know uh, these are core commitments of America, and we understand where they're coming from. And suddenly you've got a president saying, actually, they're not. I'm going to throw them up in the air. So that's on the policy front. It's he's uh, introduced instability. Temperamentally, I think it really matters. People think, you know, who, this president who's tweeting out his foreign policy and so confrontational, but so um, volatile. That also introduces uh, an element of instability. So there was a European defence minister who I saw not so long ago said to me that one of uh, her problems was that uh, sh- she would always wake up and think, you know, what has the White House tweeted last night? <laughs> um, and it was it was uh, because it could it can create domestic problems for them. So, for example, just a, it's a it's a it's a small example, but gives you a sense of what it's about. So, tr- one of Trump Trump's many tweets was that the F-35 plane, I think, is, is, a, mass, is a rip-off, massively uh, too expensive, which is slightly difficult for the European allies who've bought this plane. Uh, and, and, and then now have to go to the parliaments and say, uh, you know, defend it to the opposition who say, well, you know, we have it on the authority of the American president that you've been ripped off. What are you, what are you going to say about that? So, um, so Trump's sort of temperament is, is this second layer of... of uh, unreliability. And then I think the third is that as people see the political turmoil that's taking place in Washington, they have to ask themselves now, is he going to be around in a year's time? Um, and then, so how do we, is it, does it make sense to get too close to him if he's going to go? Uh, and I think that, you know, the Saudis and the Israelis clearly have decided 
look, he's, he's the guy in possession, so we have to deal with him, and most people will. But there will be a sense that, particularly if he asks you to do something very radical and new, to say, well, maybe this is just a sort of a passing phase in the United States, and we'll pay a price if we do something uh, that Trump, that is very Trumpist, but probably not the way the United States would normally behave. Okay, so let's come back to the other elephant in the room that, that you raised earlier, but we didn't really um, dig into, and it certainly um, comes back to the use of Twitter and, and tweeting as a method of diplomacy, mm. um, and that is North Korea mm. and the, the potential of a nuclear confrontation arising over North Korea. But I think the, the, the real question here is the extent to which the new administration is pressing the Chinese in a different way to try and force the issue with North Korea. And Twitter is one of the ways that Trump has been signaling to the Chinese that they should um, help when it comes to North Korea. But how effective do you think that strategy might be and what do you think is the potential risk the well, nuclear confrontation or war on the Korean Peninsula, perhaps. Well, as, as you say, I mean, Trump, is Trump has, uh, there's, there's a couple of strands to his policy. One is this effort to get the Chinese to deliver North Korea. The second is to imply strongly uh, that, that the U.S. will take military action if, if all else fails. Um, but I don't think either of those, in the end, are going to deliver. Um, so you may end up, as you have with these other policy issues we were discussing with Trump, back with a fairly traditional American approach, uh, which is, in the case of North Korea, to say, you know, we don't really have a solution to this and we're going to probably have to live with it. Uh, now, temperamentally, he may not be prepared to do that, but let me explain why I think that the, the, both the China option and the military option will not work in the way that Trump wants them to. I mean, I think there's no doubt that North Korea is very vulnerable to economic pressure from China. It's a poor country. It's only got one land border. It's got China's its only ally. Um, one, one land border that's open, the South Korean one's closed, obviously. Um, so China could put the squeeze on them, no doubt about it. But whether that would actually cause um, them to give up their nuclear program, I think is still open to question because this is a a regime which is focused on one thing and one thing alone, which is its survival. And it, it has been prepared in the past to tolerate uh, f a famine that killed hundreds of thousands of North Koreans but didn't actually move the regime. So it's possible that you could cause enormous economic suffering in North Korea through sanctions but not actually get the regime to change course. And then I think the second question, and the one the Chinese will raise, and I have some sympathy with them on this, is, is it actually such a good idea to destabilize North Korea? I mean, it sounds like, of course, you want to get rid of this regime, but it is nuclear armed. It also has enormous conventional weaponry. And I think that probably one of the few situations in which I could see the North Koreans maybe actually being tempted to use their nuclear weapons would be if the regime felt that its survival was absolutely at stake. At that point, they become really dangerous. So do you want to go down that road or might you look for a more uh, you know other ways of trying to deal with it through engagement through evolutionary change and I'm not suggesting those are silver bullets that will work particularly well either but as the people around Obama used to say North Korea is the land of bad options it's not like there is there is an option out there that that's going to work uh, but I think and then finally the one that Trump is clearly drawn to, but I hope people will have explained to him, as they have in other cases, that it's not as simple as it looks, is the military option, which has actually was considered by Bill Clinton, by Obama. But when you look at it, uh, it's, it's crazily dangerous because it's not clear that you could at all that you could take take out the North Korean nuclear facilities. They probably have now something like 20 nuclear weapons. They're dispersed around the country. Some of them are on, you know, in submarines and so on. Uh, so if you did a first strike and they were left with nuclear weapons, you're obviously open to nuclear retaliation. And even if uh, you couldn't, they didn't do that, they have enormous conventional weaponry which could... Uh, 
level, Seoul, the capital of South Korea, level. I mean, it could do enormous damage, kill hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and incidentally, there are American bases within range of North Korean artillery, both in South Korea and in Japan. So it's probably not a great idea to, to a stage a preemptive strike. Fair enough. So I'm going to shift gears a bit and, and, and take a, a question or it will lead us to another another part of the world. And, and one of the things that the, the Chinese have done very effectively is increase their engagement on the continent of Africa and in development programs there. And this questioner asks, with, pres with President Trump moving to stop or limit foreign aid and USAID funding, might China expand its own foreign aid programs to eat away further at America's soft power in the world? Yeah, I, I think uh, they will, um, quite, quite s almost certainly. But I think that the main agent of Chinese influence uh, in Africa has been trade rather than aid. It's, uh, they, they have become the major trading partner of, of many countries in Africa and also a huge provider, again, of infrastructure spending, which is part of this whole one belt, one road thing. Uh, and I thought there was um, an interesting moment at the tail end of the Obama administration where Obama goes to speak to the Organization of African Union Unity in, in Addis Ababa and understandably makes uh, a great reference to the fact that his father was was an African and his connect, personal connection to the continent is very warmly received. But the building in which he spoke to, the OAU building, uh, it's a gleaming new headquarters, had been built by the Chinese. The, 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 the motorway which he drives into town on had been built by the Chinese. You pass a uh, large industrial estate which was full of Chinese companies that had relocated from southern China because they were now you know, going to make the T-shirts in Ethiopia rather than in there. And that was a sign of, of the very powerful economic forces that were at, uh, at work. And uh, Ch the, China's presence in Africa is incredibly visible now. Um, just in, uh, you know, not just industrially, but as the questioner said, in, in, in terms of aid. So a friend of mine who was just in Namibia um, emailed me a photo of the sc a school they'd passed, which was the Mautsi Tung Primary School in, in, in Walvis Bay, Namibia, um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, that's where the money had come from. Fascinating. Well, the other area that the um, I've got a bunch of questions are focused on on domestic issues in China. So, so let's take a moment and just and and let's look at that. Um, one of the questioners focuses on an, a long-standing argument, which has been that that if if you engage China economically, you will see the Chinese people rise up out of poverty, and that. It, creating a much higher quality of life will then lead their human rights policies to mm. evolve and change. Do you see this as something that's happening that we can anticipate? Well, I think that that was the American assumption uh, about how China would develop. Um, and that was one of the reasons why um, they took a fairly benign view of the rise of China. I think George W. Bush said trade freely with China and time is on our side because they thought that they had this sort of model in their head that exactly that, as a, as a country becomes more economically sophisticated, there'll be a rising middle class, and as there's a rising middle class, they'll demand political freedom, and as they do that, that will either mean that uh, China becomes a democracy, in which case it will seem less threatening to the West, less threatening to the US, or it will sort of descend into turmoil as there'll be a sort of Tiananmen II and there'll be an uprising and so on. Um, and that bet has so far not played out. Uh, Indeed, if, if you had said to, to people like us, people in this room, say in 1989, just after the repression of Tiananmen Square and then after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, oh, by the way, in 30 years' time, uh, China will, the economy will have grown by something like 500%, but it will still be a one-party state and the Communist Party will be still entrenched in power. Most people then would have said, oh, no, that's impossible, that can't happen. But actually, that is what happened. Uh, and if anything, the party is digging in. Uh, it's becoming a more oppressive place. Uh, now, that might be precisely because they do fear that the more sophisticated, urbanized uh, Chinese are, are need to be kind of 
stomped on occasionally to prevent uh, things getting out of control. But for the moment, the party's um, hold seems pretty solid. Um, you know, I, I think if you look at the possible liberalization of China, probably if it were to happen, it wouldn't be through somebody suddenly deciding to hold elections, but it would be through the development of institutions like independent courts, mm -hmm. which clearly, you know, if you're going to have a property owning society, that's important to people. Uh, but you're still a long way even from that. Uh, I think the Ch conviction rates in Chinese courts are 99%. Um, so you really don't want to be arrested. Um, but uh, so for now, that, that familiar Western model doesn't, doesn't appear to work. Um, and I wonder whether it might also be because the fabled sort of Chinese middle class who are meant to be demanding their rights may actually to some extent by the government's argument that if you move towards democracy, you'll just unleash instability, chaos, and all your kind of accumulated wealth will be put in danger. Um, I think they are kind of, there is a constituency for of people who are scared by the idea of giving all the peasants out there a vote and what they might do with that vote. They're of course also, China's a big place. There are very courageous human rights activists. The, I think the activism in Hong Kong is something to to watch for, which is very interesting and has, has got going um, and is a, is a big challenge to China. Um, so, you know, it's, it's it, nobody could be definitive about how this is going to play out. But what is the case is that the, our early assumption that, well, we, knew, we know how, what economic development will lead to in political terms have been proved to be wrong. So I think you've answered this question. Is political reform necessary? <laughs> in necessary China. for who? <laughs> in yeah. China. Um, but I do want to come back to, to a, a point you made just now, which I think is an interesting one, which is this, this argument that, if, that political reform, in fact, it raises the specter of, of chaos and uncertainty in the, in the, in the social system. Mm. And one of the points that you raise and the arguments that you've made is that, is that Russia may be increasingly interested in shifting its attention eastward, mm. that there is a certain element in, in Russia now that may see more favorable relations with China rather than improving relations with Europe or the United States as a good thing, and that they may be looking to the Chinese relative success in building their economy without political reform as a model that they may m have greater affinity for than they might have once thought. Yeah, no, I think that's that's very much the case. And one of the things I try and do in the book, although the first half is about Asia, the second half is about how the rise of Asia is changing the rest of the world. Um, and Russia's a very interesting case because they, I think, after the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, there's a sort of decade where most Russian intellectuals and politicians think, okay, we really have to converge with Europe and with the West. That's, that's the model that works, and uh, it's also economically where we have to go. Um, and they've now really, uh, that, that view is now still held by some liberals in, in, in Russia, but not by the ruling class and uh, the p people around Putin or the intellectuals around Putin who are uh, reinventing a kind of philosophy of Eurasianism where they look uh, very much at, China, at, at Russia's Asian heritage as much as its European heritage. And that's partly because relations with the West have gone so badly wrong. The, the conflict in Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, uh, and then Western sanctions imposed on Russia mean that the people around Putin are very hostile to the EU and to the US. Uh, and they, whatever we think, do believe that we were t attempting to undermine their democracy, their democracy, not that we were attempting to impose a democracy on them uh, through sponsoring NGOs and so on and cultivating unrest in, 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 the, in Ukraine, which they saw as a model for what we were going to then try and do to them in Russia itself. And so they have a kind of fellow feeling with the Chinese. Uh, as the countries that are resisting Western interference uh, aimed at overthrowing their regimes. Um, and the interesting thing is that I think the Chinese feel that as well. I talked about their response to Hong Kong. Uh, 
their view of what was happening in Hong Kong was strikingly similar to the Russian view of what had happened in Ukraine, that this is not some indigenous movement, this is all troublemaking by the West. Um, but you asked specifically about Russia. There was a, a, I had a, interesting conversations in Moscow in the course of the research of the book with people who were... Uh, there's a guy called Nikonov I interviewed who um, is actually the grandson of, of Molotov, as in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and yes, is now I know him. Uh, right, a Duma <laughs> member. And, uh, yeah, he was saying it was uh, that, that we, we had forgotten, we, the Russians, had forgotten our Asian heritage, that, that Russia was shaped as much by the Mongol invasions as by the European influence, that it's never been a wholly European country, it's, it's something different, that two-thirds of its territory, after all, is in Asia, not in Europe, uh, and that, that another what Russian intellectual said to me, you know, Peter the Great put the capital in St. Petersburg, but now if he were alive, he would put the capital in Vladivostok because all the dynamism is now in Asia, not in Europe. That's where we should be looking. And part of that was, I think, sort of rationalization of the situation they found themselves in. But partly it was a res more positive response to seeing the dynamism of China in particular and hoping for a kind of special relationship with China. Now, it's not a very equal relationship. And as we were talking earlier, I think in some ways the Chinese long term are a threat to Russia because uh, their natural sphere of influence kind of overlaps with the one that Russia itself would like. And indeed, uh, Russia grabbed quite a lot of territory off China in the 19th century. And uh, that must be at the back of everybody's minds too. So if we if we think of the world and we th we think of the world as naturally having spheres of influence, um, one of the questions that I have is if American dominance and, and influence in the world is is on an inevitable d decline, where are we retreating from our commitments around the world, and what is what is the impact of the rise of China? in the face of what appears to be a declining influence of the U.S. and yeah. the West. Well, I mean, I think that's a really key question is, does America accept the idea of spheres of influence, and should it? Um, and there are those, you know, we talked earlier about the possibility of a, a war between the U.S. and China. There are those who argue that actually the only way to really put that threat to rest is for the U.S. to explicitly grant a sphere of influence to China, almost like a sort of 19th century Congress of Vienna agreement, and say to the Chinese, yeah, okay, you are this emerging superpower. We accept that you will be, to some extent, the dominant power in your region, um, and, and to do that explicitly. I don't think that is yet sort of strategically necessary or morally the right thing to do, although I, I've thought about it. I mean, I, I, can see, I can see the power of that argument. But I think that, that for the moment, it would be a mistake to concede it as an idea because it would mean abandoning something that I think has been pretty central to America's approach to the world, which is the idea that uh, there are a set of kind of universal values uh, that all countries should be allowed to, to pursue. Because once you start saying East Asia is a Chinese sphere of influence, what does that actually mean in practice? It's not just things like control of shipping lanes. It's about China being able to have some sort of say over the domestic political arrangements of countries uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, because they won't want... They find democracies nearby saying rude things about the Chinese leadership not really to their taste, not extraditing people they would like to have extradited, all that kind of stuff would, would begin to happen. Um, and that would be quite unsettling. Uh, and it would actually have implications beyond the immediate neighborhood because this, as we were saying earlier, is the most dynamic part of the global economy. To say, okay, well, China's writ rules here is a huge thing to say and are not something you want to do lightly. So how can... And I think the other reason that America would be justified in pushing back is that it's not something that, that the neighborhood wants. Mm -hmm. uh, if all the other countries, big countries in the region, were happy with a Chinese sphere of influence, then I think it would be morally hard to resist it and actually practically very hard to resist it. But as it happens, Japan, India, Australia uh, are not countries that, that want that. Uh, South Korea has wobbled around a bit, but is basically is still a, an American treaty ally. 
does not want to be in the Chinese sphere of influence. I think Vietnam certainly doesn't want to be. Um, now, that may be beginning to change, actually. If you look at some of the countries of Southeast Asia, the Philippines is an interesting example. They have a, a pretty erratic leader who's a kind of Filipino Trump, really. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, who, who um, having been a very close ally of America, he went to Beijing and said, I'm announcing a separation from the United States. China's the dominant power in the region and so on. <laughs> if a lot of countries began to do that, then I think America would have to think very seriously about, is it even feasible to resist a Chinese sphere of influence? But for now, I think it's, it's possible. And partly because of the big uncertainties about China's future that we were talking about earlier, um, it's also... Uh, n a defensible bet on the future. We don't know how China's going to develop, either internally, politically, will it become a more liberal place, will it uh, collapse into instability? So to preemptively say, okay, we, we're going to give up and pack up and go home, I think would be a mistake. Well, so I can't help but ask you to, to argue the other side for a moment. Yeah. And this is, I think, the, la the last question this questioner asks. In what ways, if any, would the world be a better place under a Chinese hegemony? I don't think it's a better place. I, I, I find it hard to think of many ways it would be a better place <laughs> under Chinese hegemony, given the current Chinese political system, uh, because it is an illiberal you know, system. So if you believe in democracy, uh, I don't think you can seriously want hegemony by the current Chinese political disposition. Uh, to give you an example, just a, like a modest one of what that might mean, we, we had a, a strange incident at the Financial Times where we published a, an advertisement for the, for, from the Taiwanese government. And we had visitors from the Chinese embassy come in and say, you know, we were very offended by that and we'd like you to pulp the entire newspaper. Uh, and we said, well, you know, we're not going to do that. But, uh, but if, if in a system of Chinese hegemony, we would probably just have to say, oh, all right, and do it. Um, so that's that. So I wouldn't really want to live in a world like that. But uh, a China that that was more like, you know, Taiwan, dare I say, offensive as that is to the Chinese, but a, a country that was actually a democratic country, open to free speech and so on, well, that would be a kind of different proposition. But then it, you'd, you'd also might be more back to a world in which you weren't talking so much about hegemony and spheres of influence and you were talking about common values and the international rule of law and all countries signing up to certain basic commitments as to how the world should be run and enforcing those jointly. So it would be great if we could get away from ideas of hegemony altogether. Well, I think you'll all join me in thanking Gideon Rachman for a wonderful <laughs> tour of the world. Yeah.